Welcome to... Oh gosh, I think this is the fifth edition of this panel. Fifth year anniversary of this panel. God. So, welcome to Tips and Tricks to Saying Mentally Strong and Healthy in a Community, or just in general. I really should change the name of that at some point. That's too long. Um, so, friendly disclaimer, uh, we are not professionals. We, we're both neurodivergent. We're both mentally ill people, so... Aren't we all? We, 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 we like to think we can speak about this. Yeah. So, that's about as deep as it goes. <laughs> but it's just a disclaimer aspect that don't hold this liable. XOXO. That's the disclaimer. So, I am. What? Okay. Well, leave it propped open. Take a chair and prop it open! Let's keep talking, don't let me. Let's all just stare at him. No, 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 no. Alright, so I am Aaron. I also go by Silver Lichen or Silver or whatever variation you think. This one over here. Want to introduce yourself? I'm Lucas. I go by Mars. Mars preferably. That's just, that's about it. That's as deep as it goes. Alright. Sweet, that does actually work. So, what is mental health and what can I do to aid in. Uh, like recovery or just helping yourself out when you're in times of hardship because given how things are still going with the pandemic and whatnot it can get really really rough uh so mental health has a description or at least the definition of mental health is a person's condition with regard to their psychological and emotional well-being who here is neuro neurodivergent of some level Wow, I'm so surprised. <laughs> no, literally everyone. Wow. All right, so mental health can rise and fall with like different pressures or different struggles, um, such as the pandemic. The pandemic is a big one. Uh, it could also be failing some classes in school, or it could actually be an effect caused by uh, struggling with mental health. There's a lot of different things that can factor into this. Um, you can very much help your mental health by taking part in self-care. Who here does that? <laughs> taking time for yourself to recharge. Self-care can be a multitude of things. Uh, basically, I dumb down self-care to whatever makes me feel happy. Because sometimes acts of self-care can be very stressful. Like some things as simple as like going to make a meal. I know for me, if I said, wow, like, I've been like rotting these clothes all day and all week. I just changed them. That's self care for me. Because it was a thought that I said, hey, I'm going to take this action to attempt to try to do something good for myself. It could be as little or as big as you want. Yeah. It could be just a small thing. It could be watching your favorite YouTuber or like eating ice cream. Anything you like to do that makes you feel better. Playing your favorite game, reading a book, listening to an audiobook, yeah. making a fursuit <laughs> in a week. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, wow. So, this self care is only just one option out of many that you can do, and hopefully, this panel can help both either you or a loved one or even just someone that you meet in the future. I also just want to add quickly uh, in your beginning description of mental health. I know one thing I struggle with personally is trying to find a reason, like why am I so sad right now? Why am I hurting so much right now? Sometimes it just isn't a reason. And accepting that is being like, it's okay. There doesn't have to be a reason all the time. I'm allowed to feel like this, you know? Because it's easy to compare yourself to other people and be like, they, they want through so much. I can do that. Why am I so sad? Everyone's allowed to be sad. Everyone's allowed to be hurt, you know? There's no defining characteristic you have to go through. Like, oh, you're happy. Yeah, it, it is especially hard. Some of the friends that I have, they struggle really, really badly with um, trying to come to terms with like, it's okay to feel like this. This is my problem. This is what I'm upset about. And not comparing it to someone else it might have worse or might have it better. So, um, what are some kinds of mental disorders? I'm not going to be able to touch on all of them. There are so many. <laughs> Uh, some of the most common ones are depression and anxiety, PTSD, schiz uh, schizophrenia, bipolar, and borderline personality disorder are just a few to name. Um, 
they come in different shapes and sizes. I definitely know this with at least my depression and with my anxiety. Some of my friends have worse anxiety, some of them have not as bad as depression as I do. And that's okay. It's just how we go about, I guess, exposing it to not only just your friends, but also your family and how they see like, oh, they're really, really depressed. Oh, they're really anxious. It can, it just varies from person to person. And again, that's okay. Um, it, a lot of things that are also kind of different is how severe and how often it may resurface, especially if you are on a good streak. Let's say that you're going like a month and you're feeling good every single day, you're waking up on time, you're getting up, getting food, getting dressed, taking a shower, going to work, and then suddenly it can just drop. You're suddenly not in a good place and you don't know what to do. Um, this can vary from person to person, as I said, and it's, it's okay. Sometimes you need to be able to pick yourself back up. And I can see Lucas is having his hand raised, yes. Adding on to that, one thing I love saying is recovery isn't linear. You're allowed to make mistakes and you're allowed to fall in your knees again and feel like you're at your wit's end. But it's okay to do that. All that matters is how you choose to act after that happens. Because I know we've all had some in our mental health where like everyone's saying, we did so good, but now what happened to all that progress? What matters is if you get to that point and you're like, you know what, no, that happened, we're now in the present. It's time to work again to that point. You know, recovery isn't linear, you're gonna make mistakes. It's not a straight line at all. Exactly. So, um, anything else you want to add about different kinds of disorders? There's a lot of different kinds. I'm currently two years deep into studying psychology right now, so I want to become a forensic psychologist. There are many different types of mental disorders, and a lot of them are actually hyper stigmatized. Because of the stigma, because of that, you shouldn't feel ashamed or embarrassed for having that disorder. Like I said, I'm going to forensics, and one thing I hear all the time is so many like killers are bipolar. And I'm like, oh boy. That makes me feel great about myself, right? It's learning to destigmatize for your own good so you feel good about yourself. You know, there's a lot of stigmatized disorders out there, but learning to accept it for yourself and to educate other people on it's normal. It's okay. There's a lot of feel this way and act this way. Like, it's all good. Can I actually uh, just real quick, I want to second that like a lot. I'm actually a pharmacist and one of the things that I do with like my patients when they come in, especially if they're in like for new mental health things, is I'll tell them like I have depression, anxiety, bipolar too, like I've got all of these things. Like you are not bad for having these. There's nothing wrong with you for having these. Like you know, and like look, I've got a bunch of these things too, it's like I have a doctorate. So like there's nothing that you like can't do. That's that's so. really sweet for you to do for your patients. Because it helps them like see what they can do. Yeah, because like it, it, it's something that like something that we deal with. It's not something that like stops us from being the best that we can be. Exactly. Right. Along those lines, we can easily see that at least in the film industry, there is quite a few stereotypes. Mm. It's not great. Um, and while many people will associate different mental disorders or mental health issues with what's going on in the film industry, most times, that's not true. Um, I'm gonna bring this one in, and I hate every minute of it. I know what you're bringing in. Who here has heard of or watched the movie Split? <laughs> I haven't watched it, heard of it. Oh, it is hate. such a terrible movie. I'm sorry. The representation of that movie is, it's like they read about it for a second, you're like, done, we got it. We, so, this is not to be harmful at all. So what he's referencing is DID and OSDD. Disassociative Identity Disorder and otherwise specified disassociative disorder. There is no such thing as an evil enemy or an evil alter. I hate it so much. But, but it's an example of how a film adaptations or representation in films is not always accurate. Very few times where it is accurate. Does anyone here know of an actual movie or TV show that accurately portrays mental health disorder? Moon Knight. I have a necklace from Moon Knight. From Moon Knight? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely very much like Moon Knight. I do think some. 
Hello. I do think some of the portrayals were like, uh, what's the word? Definitely like cinematography aspects of it. But the portrayal of it, especially when it hit the backstory, was gorgeous. It was absolutely Yes. So, and please tell me if I'm wrong, so I've only seen it once, but I, if I remember correctly, like, Chow and Rage, I think they tried very hard to try to say through the, like, the PTSD of the child. I very much do remember that, but I don't think I've seen it. For what show? Child of Rage. Child of Rage. I haven't seen that either. She was, like, a, actually, I can't talk about the film at her oh. at the top, but, um, very, very bad life, and she, like, has, like, no care about the people or anything else, and, and yeah. her life, like, slowly, Past them um, through her like her trauma, um, but they actually like, they based it off of a real story from this uh, young girl tried to try to truthfully and faithfully live through it. Yes. Um, I um, I think that the Little 
tiny babies. So when I came out, she was like, finally, I can wrestle. I can wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that, that's a harmless, fun. Instead of being like, oh my god, oh my god. <sighs> it's like, we're, we're normal people. Uh, you know, any trans person knows this. We're just normal people existing in our normal lives. I had a similar story um, when I came up to my sister as bi. She was like, oh, me too. And we just started talking about all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> that is adorable. Yeah, my partner is bi. I myself am pan. So being able to talk like, oh my gosh, this guy is so hot. Oh my gosh, she's really hot. <laughs> Holy crap. It actually, it's something that at least I think um, can help relationship bonds. So moving forward. Let's talk some mental health tips. Going to reiterate, because there are now new people in the seats. Disclaimer, we are not professionals. Please do not file lawsuits against us. <laughs> I would not like that. How about you? Okay, first up, depression. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, for depression at least, it helps with me, and I know it helps with you a little bit. Find small victories in things. Like, sometimes for me it's hard to get up and get out of bed in the morning, and I just end up sitting in my bed scrolling Instagram or YouTube or whatever for an hour before I get up. Finding small victories in getting up out of bed, brushing your teeth, making some food, getting dressed, taking a shower, those are small victories. Even if you just drink, even if you chug the last bit of the water in the water bottle, that's a victory. You don't need to call me out like that. I'm sitting in the middle of the night, like, parched. It's... The water that you drink, like, suddenly when you wake up in the middle of the night and you drink, it's the most refreshing thing known to man. I don't know why. Um, as Lucas mentioned, recovery is not linear. There are going to be times where you fall going to be times where you rise above that original bar. And that's okay. It's a lot of being able to accept that it's not going to be easy. Recovery is never easy. Um, it can go from depression, it can go from being an alcoholic, it can be addicted to some other drug. Recovery is never linear. Um, one thing that I like to tell to at least some of my friends, uh, this might not help some of you, but just in case. Oh crap, now I forgot. <laughs> um, things will be okay. I cannot guarantee that it will happen right away, but it will happen. Sometimes what you need to do is wait. Keep telling yourself, one more day. One more day after this. Just going step by step by step. I know something I used to do in eighth grade when I was really struggling. Especially if I was in a situation where it felt like a world catastrophe, like this is ending. Because, like I said, I'm bipolar, so I experience very intense emotions out of nowhere. I told myself, if I just keep breathing right now, I'm going to be breathing to a point where I'm not going to be upset anymore. I'm not going to be sad anymore. This emotion's going to pass if I just keep breathing. And that was kind of like motivation for myself. Like, if I just breathe this out, breathe through it, it's already be nighttime. I'm going to be in bed and happy and in bed. Mm. Bedtime is a good time. <laughs> I love my bedtime. Um, if you are on a medication, especially for depression, putting your medication somewhere like in the kitchen helps you to be able to get up and go take your medication. It can also help you say, like, huh. I'm kind of hungry. I should make a little something. It could be like you always should eat when you take your meds. Please do this. This is a threat to all of you. I learned that the hard way. It was that fun. Um, but yeah, it could even just be like a slice of bread, toast it in the toaster, put some butter, or maybe jam, whatever you please. I love animal crackers. It is substance. You gotta take your meds, but you get some Doritos. They're they're Doritos. Cool ranch. If you shall. Yes. Sorry. Oh, please. Um, so I really like this idea. The only thing I will say, though, for people, especially if you have trouble remembering to take your meds, is put it somewhere where you're always going to see it. Yes. Because, like, the number of times that I have to, like, wake my wife up and be like, get your booty in the kitchen and go take your meds, <laughs> uh, because she puts it somewhere where she can't see it, is 
six out of the seven nights a week. So like, <laughs> make sure that it's somewhere that you're gonna see it. Like uh, all of us in Seattle, like most, I should say all, most of us drink coffee like fiends. So I put my bed next to the coffee pot because then I can't get away from it. Which coincidentally, my coffee pot is in the kitchen, so then I make food. Another advice, don't feel like us. Remember your meds when you're packing for the convention. Yes, this is a big yeah. thing. Can I, can, I one, can I follow up on that real quick? It's like that's a great thing. Sorry. So I love it. I love I, it. I get really passionate so about you're the, you're the medical person that we can't be. <laughs> yes, but I'm like, I'm not a physician, so I can't really say a whole lot. Because then they're like, you're not a real doctor. I'm like, well, technically I am. But yes, I guess. Um, definitely a real doctor. <laughs> okay, um, so if you do forget your meds, uh, especially most mental health meds, not all of them, I'm not trying to say they all are, I am definitely on some expensive mental health meds myself, but a lot of them, like the old SSRIs, SNRIs, things like that, are really cheap. You can have them transferred from your pharmacy, wherever it is in the United States, to a pharmacy here. The only thing that you can't do mental health-wise with that is like Adderall and stimulants, so you can't transfer. But everything else you can, if you forget your Zoloft, you can transfer it here, you can buy it for like 10 bucks. Go, go on goodrx.com and get a 30 day supply. You get set, you don't forget your meds, you don't have like those weird withdrawals. I hate those withdrawals. Um, so, that's why you take them with food. Yes. <laughs> yeah, also that, yes. But uh, but just as a, like a heads up, if you guys haven't done that yet and you're going to be here for a while, that could be one way to do it. Wow. You just basically go into a pharmacy, say, This is the other pharmacy I, I got my meds at. They call, they transfer it over, they fill it for you. We still haven't been established with a new provider since moving, so. Fair. Don't even have an active prescription at the moment. Just Fair. going through the last ones that we got left. I'll send you the names of some people if you're okay with that. Uh, <laughs> anyone in the Tacoma area? I uh, uh, know a guy who does uh, eat, uh, mostly eat prescribing. So, like, if this is on the community. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is the first community, y'all. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right. right now. On that topic, it's a small victory. Take your medication. Woo! Woo! Gold star! Um, another thing, this is one that I, I I know is always a struggle for me. I don't know if it's a struggle for you. No, I have no shame. <laughs> wow, okay. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Listen, it's I'll explain that in a second. It's okay to ask for help. Asking your friend, asking a family member that you're close with, even seeking professional help. They're there to help, and they want to help. It is hard finding the right person, but once you do, you're set for a good long while. The reason why I said I have no shame when I said it comes to asking for help is I understand it's not something that all people can reach mentally, but for me, I realize that I'm not my mental health. I am myself, I am my human. My mental health is a part of me, but it's not who I am. As well as, even though it's super hard to do this, I had this like moment of realization one day of like, this is the only chance I get. Like, I'm going to make it the happiest chance I get. I literally did. I felt like the guy with the apple and salt tree. Um, I thought that's as good. Yeah, and he was like, huh. So that was me. I was like, wow, I have work? That's so crazy. Um, and the reason why I say I'm in shape asking for help is if you go to someone you know and you trust and you love, they're not, they're going to be happy that you asked for help. They're going to be happy. They're going to be happy that you went to them, you confided in them, and you trusted them to be like, hey, I'm not facing it right now, I need support. Whether, regardless of what that support looks like for you, they're going to be happy that you came to them. Because if you didn't, like, you're just going to be unhappy. They don't want that. The good thing, at least, that I have with him is he lives five minutes from me. So <laughs> every once in a while, he'll be like, hey, want to go get coffee? And it's like 8 o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what what are you doing? <laughs> Listen, I'm a barista, okay? <laughs> Coffee. Um, but yeah. If you, as I said, it's at least hard for me. I grew up in kind of a position of like, hide your feelings. Um, it's kind of like, as Elsa said, seal don't feel. Don't let them know. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's kind of the mentality that I grew up in, so being able to ask for help, at least from friends and sometimes from like professionals, is not easy. The professionals want to help you. Yeah. That, they're, that's their, they're, it's their job. If you think you're annoying them, they, they literally apply for that job. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like when someone came to my coffee shop and was like, give me coffee, and I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't want to make a call. Like, I work there, man. That's what I do. 
But I just have one other, I have a question for you. Do you like like helping other people? Are you one of those people who are like, I don't want to have to get help myself? He's a therapist. I feel called out. I'm just asking. <laughs> yes, so I, is, I am a therapist friend, and it has gotten me in trouble more than once, and I'm trying to learn how to step away. Understandable. So here's the one thing that I would say, and hopefully I'll help you around in too. Um, by you asking for help, you normalize it, and therefore help everybody else around you. Exactly. So just remember that the next time you feel like scared to ask for help. I'll be quiet next. <laughs> it's so calm. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> um, thank you. Next up, anxiety. Mm. You want to cover this one since you know this one the best? Slay! Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so, okay, have fun. Anyways, um, again, for me, when I was around in eighth grade and freshman year, for me, uh, my anxiety was at all time peak. I was on so many different anxiety medications to try to calm it, and nothing did. And I'm kind of an epiphany moment kind of guy. For me, one thing that helped me is because I think in a very realist mindset is that what I'm anxious about will be gone by the tomorrow. The way I judge the severity of situations is if in a day, it's not going to affect me, I'm fine. If in two weeks, let's look at it. If it's still going to affect me by a month, then it's something big. But if my anxiety that I'm having right now, like, as an example, I was like, oh my god, I have to go to this panel and speak to people. I was like, by tonight, by literally tonight when I go home and go to bed, it doesn't matter anymore. Like it doesn't matter anymore. That kind of helps me gauge my anxiety. Like, because when I realize it doesn't matter, they don't matter. You if know? It's, if it's gonna impact me later, maybe it's something to be anxious about. But if it's not gonna impact you in the long run, then it's a passing emotion. Exactly. And, and then that's okay. One thing that I very much preach is grounding techniques. I use so many different types of grounding techniques, and they can be used for absolutely anything. You put in the anxiety slide, if you have anxiety, that's gonna be but with any mental disorder you have that causes you to be anxious or feel negative, dissociate, things like that, grounding techniques are so good for you. Whether it's a stimulant, whether it's an auditory, anything that makes you feel connected is super important. One that I taught myself in eighth grade when I was anxious was I would go from top to bottom, from bottom to top, and list everything I'm wearing and where I bought it, how I bought it, and where did I get it. Because by the end, you know, I go through my shoes, my socks, my jeans, my shirt, my sweatshirt. I you know, have rings on my necklaces, my earrings, everything. I go through the whole nine yards. And sometimes I would stop, like, what did I buy these jeans? Now I have to sit, think about the jeans I'm wearing, right? And so by the time I finish doing that, like, I'm calmer. So I distracted my mind from the main source of anxiety. So finding a grounding tip that works for you is super important. And I will be covering some more grounding tips later after. And I emphasize works for you, because I learned some from my old therapist, and I was like, these aren't working for me. They don't do it for me. That's one thing that frustrated me was getting tips and advice that wasn't for me. Right? Create your own. Figure out what you need because you know your best yourself the best. It's your own spot. Um, this is one that I love. I love this one. Anyways, um, communication is so important and it's so scary to communicate with those around you. But the reason I emphasize its importance is when I'm upset, which I can get upset rather easily, I don't want to lash out at the people that I'm around. And regardless if I hate them or I love them, I'm not going to do that, I'm not going to be that person. What I will do, which it feels very belittling and embarrassing, but I'll say, hey, I'm really upset right now, I'm going to go over there to calm down, I'm going to come back when I'm calm. When, you, when I first started doing that, I felt dumb, I felt stupid, I was like, oh my god, like, why am I showing this person that I'm upset, why am I being vulnerable around them? But I realized if I lash out of them, then I'm going to feel like an asshole, and then they're going to be hurt. No one's winning the situation. Everybody wins. If I go stand in the corner for a few seconds, then come back and I'm like, hey, I'm sorry. Everybody wins in that situation. And one thing I emphasize is I statements, which I thought was stupid. Love to use them now. I statements are basically like if I was in a fight with my mom, I wouldn't be like, mom, you did this, and you made me so mad, mom. Like, I can't believe you did that. Because that was going to make her feel attacked, and I'm just going to lash out of it. And it's going to keep going. I statements are, I felt really attacked by what happened. I didn't like what I heard. I didn't like the situation. You put yourself in the spotlight so that they don't feel attacked. They understand they didn't like the actions, but you're no longer attacking them, even though it's not really. You're no longer making them feel attacked, and you're protecting yourself. I really believe in I statements, and they've gotten through so many different types of arguments in a healthy, productive way. That's, that's something I really emphasize. And then, Again, adding on to the slideshow is like also very simple things communicating with people. It's like 
just say, I call it like speaking in like simplest terms, say it in the easiest way possible. I feel super anxious right now, can you please help me? I am super upset right now, can you turn this music off, it's overwhelming. No. What? <laughs> <laughs> One thing that I notice is super hard to do is a lot of us feel like we have to portray our emotions in this deep, meaningful, like poetic sense, which yes, but at the moment, I'm like, Mom, Dad, I'm so depressed right now. I'm going to go upstairs and not come out. I'm alive, but I'm so sad right now, and I don't want to be around people. Instead of just disappearing, and they're like, where is he? You communicate those around you so to understand what's going on. Nothing on the details. Just be like, not feeling good, upstairs, time. As well as this one, no, this is Mr. Mr. Man there. What was it, pharmacist? CBT, what is it? Yeah, CBT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cognitive yeah. behavioral therapy. This one, this one's a hard one. This one I don't like, but I love, but I hate. It's also known as exposure therapy. It's basically, oh, you know it. I heard that side. It's basically, <laughs> wow, I hate doing this. We're going to do it on purpose in micro doses to expose you to what makes you anxious so you're no longer anxious. I, in the past, have suffered from valid OCD. And one thing I hated was carpets. Hated them. Thought I was going to die. Carpet. 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 And my therapist like, stand it. And I was like, no, I'm not doing that. And then I did. More and more and more. Over and over and over again. Even though I literally thought I was going to die. And then eventually I was like, wow, I don't even notice I'm saying I'm perfect. Right. You gotta explain yourself in micro doses to what you don't like. That's why I get over my social anxiety. It's like, I'll just. Yeah, that's about it. I'm just too much. Yes. I just wanted to point out the CBC actually, um, there's uh, scientific data on it that it is about the same amount of effectiveness as the medication is. So, so if you can't afford the medication and you can still do the CBT, uh, it will actually help. Now, the best is to use both in conjunction with each other, but still, it it's an amazing tool. Heck yeah. All right. Next one. This one. Fun this one, we, this one, <laughs> as you can tell the title, it's trauma. Uh, this is a very sensitive topic and I give everyone, I give everyone in this room their permission to, that if we say, not to say anything about trauma, but if anything gets too real, you speak and we skip. Yes. All right? And if you'd like, we can give you this slideshow so you can see it for yourself. But if someone, if anybody here feels uncomfortable, you speak and we skip. Or you just wave me down and be like, <laughs> uh, how do we want to see it? <laughs> no. oh, I just speak when I want to. Alright, All right. so typically when someone suddenly remembers their trauma, it typically means that their brain is ready to process it. You might not be ready to process it, but your brain's just like, nope. No, I'm ready. I'm ready. Shut up. I'm ready. Um, it does suck. It really does, especially if it happens during a con. It's awful. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it could be very different for everyone. For me, it's just like it takes my brain a minute to be like go from point A to point B. Like, remember trauma. Oh shit! What's happening? What's happening? Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay it's fine. I'll process it. This can go with different ways for different people. For me, it takes four fucking hours. I don't remember the longest, like, strand of time for at least one bit of it, but me. I don't know, what about you? Uh, well, fuck trauma, first of all. Part of my language, but Jesus. Um, yeah, that's one thing my therapist told me, is that, because I told her, and I was like, hey, memories! And she was like, aha, you're ready. And I was like, the hell do you mean I'm ready? Mm -hmm. Right? It's because even though you're not ready to process it, your body is telling you it's ready, and that's when you, in the micro doses, process that. Mm -hmm. And talking to people, listen, when I was younger, I was like, wow, nobody experienced what I experienced. I'm alone, I am isolated, this is only me. And then I talked to people. I talked to more. It took me 17 years to talk about anything. And when I did, people were like, oh my god, me too. I'm so sorry, do you want to talk about this? And find that similarity, find that connection, find those people who understand me to that level and my emotions was therapeutic when I was there. And one thing my therapist told me is like, you tell me what happened, what happened in full depth, so that way you and I can share the word. You, it's not you alone anymore, it's us. So building relationships with people is so important for me. Literally, maybe you. <laughs> 
Um, trauma can be very subjective. It can differ from person to person. Like someone might experience something really bad. Someone might experience something not as bad. Let me rephrase. Something he experiences can hurt him so badly, and he's like, oh, I get stabbed. And I can experience it and be like, or vice versa. It's subjective. Everyone's trauma Yeah. Trauma. Trauma. Oh, suck. But if you have someone there, as Luke said, to kind of, I guess, share the burden, it makes things a lot easier. Yes. Can I add something on top of that? Of course. Uh, for each different person, it's varies from person to person, depending on their setting, living, um, health, and any different kind of variable. Where it happened from one person, like let's say for example, just fe that feeling of aloneness, it can affect someone very differently if they're in a more calmer setting. Mm -hmm. Rather than someone that's been going through it for years, that can be magnified and amplified. Mm -hmm. And the way people can tackle that, again, depends on person to person of who they trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. From what I have seen in the past, all you uh, can really do is start with a bound of trust and then grow from there. Because exactly. if you go too much too fast, it can actually cause them to have a reverse uh, effect and actually go farther into their shell. Mm -hmm. So by slowly working on it, you can hopefully get there and to be able to mend what has happened. One thing I've always said to my friends, because I love helping people, is if they're crazy, they're super upset. And I'm like, you want to talk about it? They go, no. I'm like, okay, you can do one of two things. You don't have to talk about it. You can be upset around me. You can be sad around me. You can feel your emotions around me. You don't have to talk about it. Or like in Discord or in text messages, you can send me what you feel in a um, like a censored version. You know, when you censor a text in Discord, it's just the wall is black. So at least you, I'm not going to look at it, and I swear in my life I won't look at it, but that way it's out. So it's not in your mind anymore. Mm -hmm. It's out and I have it, and you can tell me later, you can read it, or you can tell me right now, please don't read it. But at least it's out of your body, mm -hmm. and it's shared, you know? Just uh, from what I've, uh, again, seen in the past, especially with a friend of mine that I've seen, sometimes the best course of action to help someone is to step back and let them figure it out themselves mm -hmm. and wait for them to come to you when they're ready. Yeah. Yeah. Because, again, like I said before, trying to go too much, too, uh, too fast, because there's some people out there that they just want to help so badly that they want to keep getting closer and closer, but subjectively they keep pushing them farther and farther yeah. away. There's like, there's a trick to it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to take. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard for people to learn and recognize. Sometimes it's not. It can be natural or it can be very difficult. Grounding is very good for trauma. I have learned this. Okay. I really just calling myself out with this panel. Good lord. Um, yeah, grounding really, really helps. I'm going to be touching on at least three slash four different methods. Um, but I'll go back to that in so miscellaneous information. Remember to ground yourself and communicate, as Lucas has stated. Communication can be very scary, especially when you feel embarrassed or what's the word you use? No. <laughs> yes, self-conscious. If you feel like embarrassed and self-conscious, it'll be okay. You can have someone, like, let's say that you're at a con and then you have, like, a really massive trigger and you're with a friend. Tell, go up to your friend and say, hey, I feel very triggered right now. Can we please go somewhere quiet? This could be in, a, in an empty panel room. These are really good for actually nice and kind of quiet environments, especially if you close the door. Um, sometimes lights can be very overstimulating. My brain. Yep. Close the blinds and turn off the lights, I believe. It'll help. If you have a room here at the convention, who here has a room? That's actually a lot more than I anticipated. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of the only way to go to this one, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> it's um, really close. Um, uh, going back up to your room, turning off the lights, closing the blinds, and just sitting there in the bed. And might I add, might I add, it is very important to do this stuff for you. For yourself because if i go i'm anxious i'm going to take a step away i relieve the anxiety sooner if i don't respect myself enough to remove myself from situations that make me anxious every time i'm in that situation it's going to get worse and worse and worse, and worse. 
and then anxiety is going to build up, and that, that leads to panic attacks and anxiety attacks. If I respect my body being like, hey, I'm nervous, and I've reached my nervous line, and I'm like, okay, I need to take a step back, you subconsciously train yourself to be like, like you train your brain that you can take care of the body. So your brain's like, okay, we're not going to get ner this nervous right now, because I know if we do, it'll like, we'll be okay, you know? Yeah. Um, another thing, this can also go for like being at a convention and you have like a hotel or if you've driven here, try and find a safe space. This can take in, like this can be in the form of being in a room uh, that you feel comfortable in, going back to your car and sitting there for a few minutes, going to a quiet room, playing some music, watching a TV show. This can be at a con, at home, or if you're just out and about. Being able to have that kind of safe space to be able to ground yourself works freaking wonders. Amazing. I love it. Um, let's see. Understand you're human. Y'all are human. We're not, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. And that's okay. They, you can fuck up absolutely royally. But... If it, in, if it impacts someone that you know, someone that you love, being able to recognize it and apologize is incredible. Not a lot of people can do that. Like, genuinely. A quote that I really like is, sometimes good people like can do bad things, so that doesn't make them a bad person. Exactly. I've done a lot of things that I am not proud of, but that doesn't inherently make me a bad person. Because afterwards, I recuperated and like made amends with that. I was like, hey, sorry, my bad. Obviously in a more professional way, but sometimes good people do bad things so that doesn't make them a bad person. And that quote really like resonates with at least me for a while. Um, let's see. Kind of going back to safe spaces. Environments can strongly impact someone's mental health. Uh, let's say that I'm brought to an area that is extremely triggering for me. That can absolutely send me into a downward spiral. Therefore, impact my mental health quite greatly. But let's say I'm back home in my room. <laughs> Some kind of environment like that where I feel safe and comfortable can help bring my mental health up or can at least stabilize me to the point where I don't feel like death every morning. And on top, on top of that, again, your emotions are valid. There is no good or bad emotions. Your emotions are emotions. You're allowed to feel them. Uh, they were meant to be. If they weren't... If they weren't, we wouldn't have a panel right now. Exactly. <laughs> um, it can be hard to accept these emotions, and it also can be incredibly difficult to come to terms with your diagnosis. I personally did not really have any issues with my diagnosis because I just looked at it every single day to the point of just it becoming the norm. And then I got my diagnosis and I'm like, huh, okay, that didn't really change. But for someone like you... No, yeah, so basically when I got my diagnosis, I was super frustrated, super upset, and super mad because I was like, I thought it was this my entire life, I was misdiagnosed my entire life, and now I got something else to struggle with, you know, and that, that was me being bipolar. That just caused a lot of issues, especially, you know, hearing about what people say about being bipolar. I was like, wow, this makes you feel great about myself. But it wasn't until I did research on what it truly means to be bipolar, what it truly means to have any disorder that I have, and understanding how someone can gain this, what they what makes them do what they do. What, like, understand the in and outs of the disorder helped me cope and understand myself a lot more. Because now when I would feel a certain way, I'm like, oh, I know I'm feeling like this because of this. Not just that's who I am. That was anything. This is my executive dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Oh gosh. Um, it's okay to be anxious or depressed for no real reason. It's still valid. Like I could suddenly get really anxious for no reason, and like let's say Lucas or my partner just asks, "Why are you anxious?" And I'm like, "I don't know." <laughs> it's okay. It, it. This is also kind of where the grounding phase comes into play. Like. Being able to calm your nervous system in your brain and whatnot is really nice. Yes? Sorry, I'm bugging you guys. You're good. I love a professional take on this. <laughs> Thank you. 
So this one is uh, both professional and personal. One thing with the like the no reason thing, uh, as almost all of us raised our hands to the neurodivergent thing, we just may not make the serotonin or the norepinephrine in our brains that we need. So like that in and of itself can be the reason why we're depressed or anxious. So like I know sometimes like I do it too, where I'm like everything in my life is great. Like why am I upset? Well, this is why, dummy, of course it is. You know, like, I, I know this. I've, I've taken uh, all these like uh, classes on it. So, like, don't feel bad. Just like you guys said, don't feel bad about it because, like, it's just your brain not making the happy juice. It's not your fault. Yeah, you, can't, you can't go in there and, like... Can I tell something onto that? Yeah, please. Uh, the opposite could also be true, where uh, everything could be going right. You could be having the time of your life, and you could have the best partner of all, but you could still feel extremely sad because mm -hmm of one reason or another. And it's not because you're doing anything wrong about it, it's just, your brain's just being a dummy. Yep. Your brain's stupid, it named itself. Yes. Um, I have, I'm a survivor of a traumatic brain injury, so one of the mental health issues that I have is this fun thing called pseudobulbar affect. Wow. And it's often misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder because it is often described as uncontrollable laughing or crying. So I'll be in the middle of a grocery store, and all of a sudden be like, one minute I'm happy, and the next minute I'm so uncontrollably sobbing for no reason. Mm -hmm. So I've had to learn how to explain to people, like, everything is great, I don't know why I'm sad, this is just, my brain do be like this something, it really do be like this something. <laughs> 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 I'd like to say, it is what it is. Yeah. And I just did this, but can I tag something on to that as well? <laughs> In the past, I've ran into scenarios like that before where I like, I could literally run a mile, work 10 hours straight, get dinner done, make the best meal of my life. I get to the end and it's just like, I don't think I did enough. Mm -hmm. I, I need to do more. And you can work yourself quite literally to death if you don't get that temper. All right, uh, moving forward, because we got about 15 minutes left and I'm realizing that I don't have enough time to spell. Oh gosh. We can speed through this. Another thing. Um, who here has an emotional support plush on them? Oh, I love it. Are those chicken nuggets? Yes. I know they're they're dino nuggets. nuggets. <laughs> so, this here is Peaches. She is an axolotl, and I love her dearly. She is small enough for me to carry in my pocket and does not become a detriment to me or other people, especially when I throw her at people. <laughs> Like that. Oh, okay. Um, but having small things like that that can make you happy, especially when you're anxious or depressed, it can help a lot. Like, I didn't really cross that, but that was what was going on during middle school and high school when I started carrying around like little things like that until my therapist told me directly. She was like, yeah, no, you're doing this because you need a source of comfort. And this is the closest thing that you can get for right now. Yeah. That was a day and a half. <laughs> um, let's see. Let's move on to some grounding techniques. This is where I come into my next question. Who here has been to my panel before? I recognize you immediately. Nice. All right. You're fine. So one of the things that I have been told is amazing is there are some. There's a breathing technique. I think halfway through this, the grounding technique list. That I think like helped like three people, but as a disclaimer, this might not help everyone. As he said, there's different things, there are different techniques to do with this. Everyone's brain works differently. Yeah. No, so, first one. This one is one my partner taught to me. This can go in multiple ways. This can be like you sitting in a chair and tapping your foot in a rhythmic pattern. This could also be tapping finger to your arm. This could also be gripping your fist in a rhythmic pattern. It could be anything of a rhythmic pattern that you can feel. Doing this is actually really nice because what you do is as you're tapping, you envision a safe and comfortable place. For me, it would be like a giant pillow fort. Nice and warm, cozy. And then you go into, what can I see? What can I smell? What can I feel? And being able to pinpoint and think really hard about those little things helps me a lot. It allows me to kind of 
focus my attention to something completely different than what I might be anxious about, or what I might just be really depressed about. It's, yeah, it's really nice, especially if you're trying to go to sleep. Uh, I know a couple times I've called him in the middle of the night and been like, I'm having a nightmare! <laughs> and then he'll just kind of calm me down, talk with me a bit, and say, do the tappy taps. And I'll do the taps. And he'll say, envision a place that makes you comfortable. No, I am not. I, I cannot be the thing that you're envisioning. <laughs> That would be sad. Yes. Um, but yeah, something like that can go a long way, especially if you're trying to fall back to sleep from a nightmare, or if you're just trying to fall asleep in general. Insomnia, go bird. Take that on bird. <laughs> <laughs> Breathing techniques. This is the one where I really like. This is the one that doesn't help me. So this I learned in Taekwondo. Um hold on. How many steps are there? One, two, three. There's four steps. So breathe in for five. Put your hands in a triangle. You can do this with me. Pointing downwards. And as you breathe in for five, bring it up to about kind of like where is this? your upper rib cage. Turn the triangle and breathe out as you're pushing down. Do this again. Bring it up and breathe. One, two, three, four, five. And we're actually going to push outwards. One, two, three, four, five. Being able to do this allows you to kind of visualize your breathing. Being like, okay, go up, 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 turn, and down. Two, three, four. So the full pattern is up, out, up, the side, up, to the sky, up, and then back down. Yeah, it's Taekwondo. That's literally what I learned it from. And apparently it helped my friend a lot when he was going through a panic attack in the middle of school. And I'm just like, huh? Huh? What do I do? Oh, I know. Breathe. Breathe. But again, this might not help forever. It's something at least good. If, if a friend is having an anxiety attack or panic attack, have them kind of watch you and breathe with you. It allows them to focus. Like, let's say you're having an anxiety attack. I'm so nervous. Okay, Lucas. Breathe. Yeah. It's so nice. I just like doing that. It's so nice. It's really good. Um, who here knows the five senses? Good. So it goes. Acknowledge five things around you. Lucas, Russ, uh, peaches, my iPad, my phone. Things that I can see. Four things that you can touch around you. One, two, three, four. Three things that you can hear. I can hear the jingling of people's badges. I can hear the crowd outside. I can hear the echo of my voice. <laughs> two things you can smell. I can't smell anything except for my mask right now, so that's as good as it's gonna get. Well, that my chest. Yeah, it is too. Um, one thing you can taste. This one might be a bit difficult. Um, this could actually help if you have snacks with you. Give me these. Yes. Listen on that. My uh, that was a hard one with my therapist. I they like, mentioned tastes and smells, mentioned that uh, like, uh, things like that. But they said instead, a lot of things they have to find with is is using that to focus on what will be better, what is okay right now. Uh, kind of a, a moment, real life, living factually at the moment you're in. Thinking that now that you've got through those things and you're back to a calm point, you stay in where you really are. Exactly. And that, it really helps to tie it up for the end. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, these can identify and focus your attention to your surroundings, and it, uh, it is best done in a safe and yet or quiet environment. Again, empty panel room definitely helps. Your car, hotel room if you're here, or if you're just going back home. And you need to get home ASAP. Just have your friends stay with you for a minute. That'll really help. Um, I'm gonna skip the next slide because that's really good. Questions! Leave the last slide up, we'll look at it on our way out. Oh perfect. Wow, Thank you. Look at you. That would be good. <laughs> yes. 
How do you separate yourself from your problems? I'm blaming that too. That's a good question. I'm thinking about it. Later. The way my boy, yeah, okay. the way I separate like myself and my problems is like I'm a human. My problems are problems. You know, they especially my mental health. It's just in my brain. My mental health is chemicals. It's chemical imbalances in my brain. It's not me. It's not who I am as a soul who breathes and thinks and feels. It's just my brain doing things on its own, right? Nothing I can control. I am my own human being, and these are my problems. They may follow me around where I go, and they may be my problems because they affect me, but I'm not the problems. Does that make sense? They affect me, I don't affect them. The brain doing the puzzle puzzle sometimes. Yes! Oh, uh, that's another thing that I think, Yuri, that's how I think is that uh, biologically speaking, we all like evolved from like tiny little mammals to mm -hmm. what we are today. And just because we were tiny little mammals at some point, our brain, there is a certain part, biologically speaking, in our brain, I forgot the technical term for it, that essentially is just like, how do I say, premature or like uh, just uh, like uh, more, uh, yeah, more like. Uh, Primal. Yeah, primal. Yeah, thank you. English second language nerd. So yes, yeah, you're doing so, yeah, my, oh, Try my best with my vocabulary set. And then uh, when you are having like mental health issues, it's essentially just that part of the brain gets weird. I guess not saying it's like wrong in any way, but like just super active or super inactive in the sense that oh my god, oh my god, like everything is like there's a predator who's gonna eat me yeah. like next yeah. moment. Like what? Yeah, like uh, how yeah. And then, yeah, it's like your frontal lobe, which is the more advanced, like human part, mm -hmm. can't really control it. That, that, that's like what you usually do. Your like more advanced function thing can like uh, do your stuff, like talk and have like a civilization or something like that. So, mm -hmm. so it's, I guess it's just that incompatibility between like like this unfortunate design flaw by God or whatever yeah. that's up there. So. <laughs> Because basically anxiety is your fight or flight. Because when you have anxiety, I'm mean, going to generalize anxiety disorder because it's the most generalized, as it said. You just you just get anxious for no reason. That's my favorite part. I'm like, I'm doing great. Not anymore. I'm nerfing it. Right? It's your brain thinking that you are in a fight or flight situation. That's why you get anxious, you tense your heart, and you start sweating because that's adrenaline. It's your body being like, whoa, we are literally going to die right now. Flee the scene. That's why I have to look around and be like, nothing's gonna kill me. You know, like I'm in my room alone, like. And plus he's attacked. That, that, that is <laughs> he, he is. Yes. I'd like to say something on who is. Mm -hmm. uh, with the triggers and stuff like that. Yes, that would definitely be able to do that as a physical trigger, but there's also like visually and, um, mm -hmm. well, in a trigger, that would be the right word. And there's, there's also auditory triggers as well. And it's, uh, in day-to-day -day life, it's hard to avoid all those triggers at once, but the best way to get around that is to figure out how to cope with it. Mm -hmm. Like we said before, uh, with the little stuff you use uh, for comfort. Uh, for me, uh, I personally find comfort in order, so I like to make lists to, uh, for what, do, what steps I'd like to take next. Mm -hmm. Like similar, uh, uh, you gotta get up, you need to brush your teeth. Uh, get breakfast, yada yada yada, like and, keep, and keep checking things off that list. I like that a lot. Like that, if you do that, then yes, you might bring this. Same though, every day. Yes. <laughs> one last pharmacy thing, and I'll be quiet. So, just one, uh, one thing to the, like um, think about if your anxiety or depression or any of your mental health issues suddenly get worse. Um, thinking about changes that have happened in your day-to-day -day life recently could be a good way to try to figure out what's going on with them. Now, when I say this is pharmacy, I, I wanted to like just kind of say, when you are on, it's, it's cold and flu season, and people who have like asthma, they have exacerbations, we put them on steroids to help open up their lungs, right? Mm -hmm. Steroids mimic uh, corticosteroids in your body, um, which uh, cortisol right in your body, which is activating your fight or flight, which makes your anxiety go through the freaking roof. So if you get put on steroids, you're going to have really bad anxiety. What happened in your life that's different? Oh, it's the steroids, it's not necessarily you. Same thing can happen with like uh, albuterol, other asthma and things like that. So if you like 
got weird things going on in your life that you feel like, oh my gosh, this is so much different, try to think about what's changed, and it can be even like the most simple things. And as I'm sure most of you know from, if you've gone to the pharmacy, um, nowadays the pharmacist literally says two words to you and then hands you your meds and you're- I think they're different colors. that I they used to be yours, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, what's going on? And they're just like, oh, it's different, here you go. Are you sure uh, it's the same? Yeah, then the matches, and I'm like, are you sure? Um, right. uh -huh. And then, like, it, it is, and they call you later, hey, it wasn't. Um, but, uh, uh, I, I've had to do that for my colleagues before. I don't, did not, did not appreciate that. Anyway, um, but, uh, just, just things like that, like if things have changed and like you've not gotten a chance to talk to your healthcare professionals about it, um, but it's something to kind of think about if like any of your medications have changed or if you've started something new because they can do weird things. Like, for instance, last thing, depression, anxiety, uh, depression medication, don't usually depression medications also help with anxiety. Well, you turn your propion, which is, that one makes anxiety way worse. Oh god! It, 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 <laughs> I mean, I'm not sad anymore. Yeah, so. yeah. You won't be sad, but you'll like want to punch people in the face when they oh, make you ooh, slightly mad.